I got, it's got to be when I can do it. So Sunday, I'm trying to get this. Make sure I get the screen talked about. Sunday and Wednesday, May 1st and May 4th. And it's going to be, as of now, it's tentatively scheduled in the auditorium, so we have enough room. Um, I thought about doing it here, I've done it here, and it's a little crowded. Used to be fine when that used to be a curtain. Now it's a wall, which I wanted, but it limits the space. So it'll be in the auditorium, and it's got to be at 6 a.m., 6 p.m. Originally, I put down, I just put down 6, and I'm like, I think anyone would show up at 6 a.m.? And yes, I would find that amusing, but then at 6 p.m., I know it's just it's when I can do it. And I will go over certain parts of it. I'll go, I'll give you some more inf additional information. It will help you immensely. That's one of the things about the review section. Not only get the material, but it, it's a nice thing to kind of come together and do this. And we haven't haven't been able to do this for two years. Um, we did it on Zoom, which is not or T, but it's not quite the same. And then Wednesday at 6 30. Same thing. I'll remind you again about those review sessions. So let's go ahead then and get uh, do some Cold War. Yeah. No, totally different. But I'll, I'll go through different things and back, back to the last page and a few things I want to make sure I cover on those um, on section seven, or seven and eight. I will go over directly on. On Monday, I'll cover that first three pages and the ones that will probably the furthest from your memory. I'll really hammer those hard. But also do some things. I'll give you some more additional material. So I'll give you stuff if you come in on that day. Okay, we practice test stuff. <laughs> oh, he's going to give us money and fame and fortune and Garfield dolls. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the Cold War. Oh, what did you think of the question on the practice test? Most of them are bad, right? Was that fair to say? Were you able to go through them? Here's the thing. How many did you do that you missed? And you're going to miss them. It's just the way it is. That you went back, but I have no idea what this is even about. How many of those were? Not very many? One or two? See, the great thing about practice tests like that is, kind of, okay, I'm going to go back and look at this. But if it's only a couple, there's a lot. Look how, look how much history we have. There's going to be stuff you don't necessarily know for sure. Just hopefully it would just be a few things. And so then you can make an educated guess, and the rest of them, you make your, you make your best educated decision on narrowing one's out, pick the right choice. You can do well. You can do really well on it. I wish I could tell you what questions it would be. <laughs> that I don't have. Okay, so Cold War. And I like this cartoon show. The, one of the things about the, especially the cold, early Cold War, was to show this kind of regulated Keynesian capitalism with, with um, kind of with some of the edges, um, the rough edges filed off in Western Europe and the United States. The thought was this would produce all these goods. And there's Truman. To appeal to Eastern Europe, and you notice they're all going and they're Stalin leading the way. Yes, it's a little creepy too, but moving on. And a couple of things we got to get though. In the United States, a significant number of women during the war, about 20% increase of women took jobs that men normally took. And that is where you're going to get the nickname Rosie the Riveter for women who worked who took these jobs, even though women rarely riveted because that was a pretty technical skill that they didn't have time to train. More women actually welded, but onto the welder didn't work. So they went closely to the riveter. And that picture in the middle, that's actually done by Westinghouse. They were best known at this time for making alternating current generators, but they were making engines for boats and uh, boats, ships. This poster right here, that's from Westinghouse. No. All right, and I have it right here. And when you ride along, you ride with Hitler. When you ride ammonia, you can ride with Hitler. And here's a woman, do, a woman doing a very difficult job of setting the fuses on artillery shells. 
scary job. But after the war, what happened? Oh, I should say my grandma, my mom's mom, did this. She made bombers. To my point of view, she made them all because she's my grandma. But she made B-25 and then B-24 and then B-29 bombs at a bomber plant in Bellevue, Nebraska. And she moved up to become a supervisor and an inspector. And what happened to her and virtually every other woman as soon as the war ended, those jobs that men traditionally had, they all got their jobs. And men that she, that actually under her, they kept their job. So that's what happened. And most of them, and my grandmother included, kind of wanted this. The thought, the thought was, let's go back to normalcy. And what was normalcy? Remember the cult of domesticity? We go back to that. But this, in a way, will help trigger 20 years down the road modern feminism. Wait a minute. Women can do jobs that men could do, or, or at least have the option to do them, instead of the only option being to, have, to be married and have children. There should be more options for women to have success. That's coming down the road. So next, also the Great Migration. Hundreds of thousands of African Americans, partially because they're kicked off of their sharecropping, sharecropping farms, they moved north, but also a lot went to California and partially encouraged to fight against this great war against fascism. And so this idea, in fact, discrimination was banned in most war contracts, uh, kind of an extension of Roosevelt's WPA program. That's a famous post. I like that. Um, I used to have one up there, but it fell apart. And, but this also shows kind of the elements of racism that still existed. Remember those pictures I showed you earlier? In fact, almost all porters on trains were called, regardless of their name, they were all called the same. Did you African Americans remember that horrible term I told you about? A horrible racist term called Santa Barbara. That's what I did. So Sam. And this ironically, though, when they're fighting for ultimate racism, when there's still Jim Crow and no voting rights in the U.S., would help trigger the movement as it became known as, even though it's going at this time, but really pick up in the 1950s. Same deal as for women's rights looking back. Wait a second. What were the, these sacrifices for? And so with that, one more thing we have to get to, Japanese internment. In February, February 19th, or February 1942, Roosevelt, as an article of war, issued Executive Order 9066. This would eventually in turn 120,000, most of them were American citizens, but people of some kind of Japanese descent, all on the West Coast. No place else, and not in the colony of Hawaii, which had a significant population of Japan, uh, people descended of Japanese immigrants. And it was claimed because of total war, there were spies, they were spying at Pearl Harbor. Now, they weren't good spies. But those who in turn had to, they lost everything. Here's papers annulling it. And here's this cluster of all Japs in California near, which is part of the reason for this anti-war feeling why that term would become really derogatory. But they lost everything. And what pushed California politicians to go for this word, it was a way to get our business, business rivalry. A lot of California businessmen and small farmers wanted to get rid of the competition. And so they lost their farms, they lost their homes. Here's a little girl with a few, they got a couple bags each. They were hopped, they were put on trains and sent to camps here. And pretty, if you've been to this area, Heart Mountain is in between two mountains, the Big Horn, and it's right just on the western edge of the Big Horns, and it's like a desert up there. And this is one of the camps and looks creepily like concentration camps that we showed before. These were concentration camps surrounded by barbed wire. Ironically, young Japanese men were still drafted into the United States Armed Forces. So they, their loyalty was um, in question, so they had to lose everything in their homes, yet they could still fight for the country. And that shows where the real reason probably wasn't a lot to do with their real threat. But this is an element of total war. They were not imprisoned in camps 
because of anything they did, but of who they were. And that's total war. By the way, German and Italian, Germans and Italians in America who were not yet citizens, they were legal aliens as they were called, they were interned in camps. There was a big one at Fort Harrison in, in uh, Missouri. I should add, there are German POWs all over Montana. Shipped them over here because where are they going to go? They can't escape. So they would, there's a like, big farms. Near Miles City, there's a bunch of German POWs. Kind of a weird little thing. Fred Karamatsu, Karamatsu, Fred Karamatsu, a born in the United States, an American, U.S. citizen, sued that he was being put in these concentration camps for nothing he did. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. That's him right there. And this, this is why, this is the camp one. Trouble against the barbed wire. Don't forget, these are American citizens, just as any other American citizen. And the Supreme Court upheld this, saying this was by military necessity. So basically deferring to a combination of the declaration of war and the fact that Congress basically gave the president the authority constitutional authority to deal with potential insurrections. In 1988, as reparations for this, the United States would give every this, every person who survived the camps $20,000. About $20,000 could buy more than them now, but still that's not very much. Uh, there was a lot of opposition, but President Reagan was first opposed, but he eventually very reluctantly signed it. And that was a drop in, I mean, kind of a drop in the bucket, but that, that is a legacy, but also tells you what total war can do. It can happen here. That's why total war is such an important thing to learn. That's why I went in such detail about it. And this fear of the enemy within, that anybody could be a traitor, even if they haven't done anything, they could be, so let's get them. One more thing. We mentioned this before, but the, the Manhattan Project to build a bomb, this massive program before Germany could build it. And this huge program. And they had, they finally came up with two different versions of a bomb that would work. They, well, one they knew it worked, the other one they weren't sure about. So actually by, by July they had three bombs. Three bombs. Where did they do this? Where was? Okay, they, the Manhattan Project was nationwide. They had the centrifuges because of the TVA in, ten, in Tennessee to separate uranium 235 from 238. Because of the Grand Coulee Dam at the Tri Cities, Washington, that's where they actually had the first nuclear reactor to make the tunnel. And that's why don't swim in the water. That's funny, I was talking about that first period, and someone said, I grew up in Richland. Yeah, Los Alamos, New Mexico. High desert, isolated, they could control it, they thought. And three bombs. The first one they knew they would work, they dropped on Hiroshima, was basically they had a can, a gun inside it. So that's why it really long and thin. And it literally shot one piece of uranium into another. And it couldn't be that big, but they were pretty sure it'd work. It that big. It was 15,000 tons of TNT. Which was huge. The other one, was a plutonium bomb. And they're working on that while they're meeting at Potsdam. So I mentioned this before, but let's get to this real quick because the thing about Potsdam, Potsdam was really this conference, the last wartime conference, but in reality, it's the beginning of the Cold War. Here's the very first meeting. By the way, here's Truman going through a destroyed Berlin. Absolutely destroyed. I should add, the first American forces that were sent to Berlin for the American occupation zone, it was a, a, it was a couple battalions of the 2nd U.S. Armored Division, and one of the men who was in a reconnaissance unit, so they're the first one ready to go, was Mr. Long's dad. Mr. Long, math teacher upstairs. His dad was in Berlin, I think, right after the war. And it's kind of one of those things. Well, when they met, here's Churchill. I'm sorry, here's Churchill 
there's Stalin, and then Truman, who was a literal unknown on the world stage. So you have Stalin, who basically came in as the victor. I defeated the Nazis. Potsdam's this uh, little town outside of Berlin. The place where the men's still there, it's really cool. Churchill, though, was there for a day and a half. He had to fly back to London for elections. The first elections they've had since 1938. Uh, and he didn't win. His party lost. The Labor Party won, and Clement Attlee came back. And Attlee was part of the wartime government. He would be, um, in some ways, a very effective leader for Britain. But to Stalin, you can imagine this. Who are Who's Attlee? Who's Truman? Roosevelt and Churchill were, were titans. Who are those guys? So he really kind of bullied them. And so Truman, desperately wanting to prove he's tough, is going to stand up, try to stand up to him. This is where Stalin said, no elections in Eastern Europe. This is where Truman and Attlee said, no reparations. Infuriating both. I should have one thing. Okay. And so with that, just absolutely infuriating. But it was here, while they're there, that Trinity was exploded. The code name for the first atomic bomb explosion in New Mexico. The thought was this would be maybe 10, 10 kilotons, 10,000 tons of TNT. It was, it was 20. Now, I gotta be honest, the scientists really didn't know how big it would be. They figured it could be 10, it could be 50, it could cause a chain reaction in the atmosphere and blow the world up. But you know, they rolled the die and went with it. Yeah, they are actually taking bets. Are we gonna be here or not? Which I find abusing. The guards didn't find that abusing at all. But here's Trinity right there. That's a plutonium bomb. That's plutonium, and it worked. That's the explosion, bigger makeup. And so that is the bomb that would be dropped on Nagasaki. The one in Hiroshima, they were 100% sure it was working, it was ready faster. They, that would be dropped on Hiroshima. And so Truman got news, it worked. And he was overjoyed. He didn't find out about the Manhattan Project until after he became president. Truman was in the dark of almost everything. They just kind of kept him out of the loop, which was a terrible miscarriage, but they did. So he got a, a telegraph saying, a telegram saying the baby is born. That was the code. And he was overjoyed. And what? who did he go to first? Stalin. In glee. You got your army. I got this. He went up and said, still holding the telegram and said, we have a farm. Don't take it personal. We have a bomb that could destroy the city. And he expected Stalin to go, ah! And what did Stalin do? Popped his pipe and said, Good, I hope you use it. And Truman was so disappointed. He really wanted Stalin to be scared. He even wrote in his diary, not a Stalin. So it's really kind of funny. Why was Stalin so nonchalant? Yeah. They were the middle. Actually, not quite. Really. They knew. They had spies in Los Alamos. The plans for that bomb were already on the way to Moscow. They make their first attempt to kill exact copy of Trinity. Oh, he didn't like the fact. It scared him, but he, he knew. So he'd be, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, well, and we'll get to that. That'd be kind of a big deal. And I'm going to get to the key. <laughs> oh, no! I've been moving. So I, I didn't get the slide. So, let me move the bikini slide. There's a reason for it. <laughs> so, after Potsdam, it was clear to the people there, there's um, um, a breakdown of peace. But most people back home thought, we're friends forever. We defeated fascism, and now we'll make a better world. 
but there were fears. And so much of the Cold War is based on fear and ignorance. So think about the U.S. Remember, they had a horrible Red Scare where they ran down labor unions, um, radicals, people they didn't like, accused of being communists or Bolsheviks. And this goes back to a long time. Remember the bomb-throwing anarchists. So there's intense anti-communist feeling. By the way, some of you put that on your test. I purposely did not mention it. Put that on your DBQ. Really good job. That is a great example of this long-term fear of the Soviets. But if you didn't, there's other ways you can other things you can ask. That was a really good one. And I look at some of your eyes and I'm like, yeah, some of you are like, and after I say it, I hope most of you are like, oh, no. They launch that back, you're okay. All right. The purges in his own people. No elections in Eastern Europe. And I put the line through, defeating the Nazis. They must be 10 feet tall. There must be something in their brain that's triggered by communism that makes them almost superhuman. And I'm not exaggerating the way that it was thought about. In the Soviets, in the USSR, they looked at the Red Scare too. They hate us. They've always hated us. Remember back in 1918 during the Civil War, the U.S. even sent troops. They remember that. They were kept out of Munich. They haven't forgotten that. The delay of the Second Front. They slaughtered Soviets so they could take advantage of it. And reparations. Not having the reparations. I should add, this whole area was a ruin. And a lot of it would not be rebuilt. In fact, parts of East Germany would not be rebuilt until the 1990s after reunification. That's how destroyed it was. And here is Truman talking to Atlee and Stalin. And I like this one, holding the bomb. Yeah, let's have a good talk, but I have the bomb. I should add, the United States is demobilizing as soon as the war ended. The United States went from an army, army, navy, and, well, Air Force part of the navy, or part of the army then. Of uh, over 14 million in a year and a half, it went down to a million. The U.S. is demobilizing as fast as possible because the U.S. did not want a large standing army. At least they thought that was changing, obviously. But the peace really collapsed, and partially, now we'll, we'll get to Stalin, but Truman was desperate to prove these stuff. The part of Reggie, not to write down, but he told the secretary, his second secretary of state, there's James Byrne, kind of a political hack, old friend of his right there. But Burns, he said, you know, we're giving in to them all the time. We're giving them everything they want. Now, i got to be clear about it. Stalin felt the exact opposite. And Stalin was intensely paranoid. Stalin was arguably the most paranoid man ever to live. Everything was a threat. He saw everything. A brilliant man. But paranoid. Hardworking man. And evil. So moving on. And then Germany and Berlin were divided. And the U.S. promised to continue Lend Lease Aid after the war. Well, the U.S. started playing games with the aid. Stalin started ordering um, some games in each his section of the occupation zone here, like cutting off the supplies in West Berlin, every once in a while, things like that. And then, no reparations, Stalin ordered his soldiers to strip everything from East Germany. His occupation zone. If you're not going to give it to us, we're going to go take everything of value. So he had his soldiers go through and steal everything they thought they could use in in Russia. Don't forget, Germany's destroyed. Virtually every town is flat. But they went through and sifted through the rubble and took nails. They took boards. They took cloth. They took bathtubs. Yes, they took the kitchen sink. They took. They went through and cut off chunks of the Autobahn, put it on trains, and set with cement back. No, I don't know what they did with it either. They just dumped it out. But they just took everything of value. If you're not going to give it to us, making this up, you're not going to give it to us, we'll take it. Making the suffering in East Germany even worse. And that's when the U.S. cut off aid. And once that happened, you could see the beginnings of the Cold War. And to prove he's tough, the United States continued atomic tests, partially because they didn't know what they were dealing with. So you see that sheep that's tied up there? They tied up a bunch of sheep on boats for the first test on a little island called Bikini Atoll. And they wanted to see, they put it on boats, what the radiation did 
to sheep near and it's further away. Yeah, so they basically tortured a bunch of animals, sheep, cows, chickens. And here's an underwater test to see what it would do to ships. So they got a bunch of older American, but also the remnants of the Japanese fleet and saw what it could do under the water. And yes, whatever it could do with the animals. They destroyed this little tiny atoll called Bikini Atoll. Now, it became big news. The test in Bikini Atoll, the test in Bikini Atoll. Well, the French clothing designer, 1947, taking advantage of that name, would dub his swimsuit Bikini, there's the first one, after those nuclear tests. So if you ever wonder why they're called that, it's because of nuclear testing and torturing of sheep. So with that, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it, so if you ever wonder where that name came from, that's where it came from. Some of you might have known, but yeah, that's the original designer. And yes, that picture is as creepy as it looks. So soon afterwards, now former prime minister, he'd be prime minister again, Winston Churchill, would make a speech in Missouri, Southwest Missouri State, where he would announce that the areas, the satellite nations under Soviet control are behind an iron curtain. He took this from the German uh, propaganda minister Goebbels. He didn't make it up, but took it. And that's from part of his speech, from Seton in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic. So to here, an iron curtain. And so through all my life, the Iron Curtain. I know some of you have heard that name, but when I was your age, it was the Iron Curtain. Man. All those areas behind or yeah, Soviet domination with Soviet puppet states. I should add, at Yalta, when Stalin promised free elections here, he really thought it was a joke. He thought that's just propaganda for the people back in Britain and the United States. Because he thought, no way. Am I ever going to allow governments here that are not friendly to my government? I want a buffer zone between Germany and the Soviet Union. Germany has attacked twice. Beat them in World War I, nearly won in World War II, and he was convinced there'll be a World War III with a rearmed Germany. Doesn't excuse what he did, but that was his thinking. So with that, but when people at home really start, when I mean home, like in the United States, Britain, in the Soviet Union, it's a totalitarian state. Turkey and Greece. Now, Turkey, there was no communist revolt, but Truman's going to lump it in there to make it sound scary. Greece, there's a nasty little military dictatorship, and there was a communist guerrilla movement there. In fact, those communist guerrillas fought to the death against Nazi occupation, and then they fought against this really just brutal dictatorship. Britain had always kind of looked at Greece as their special area. They helped Greece win their independence back in the 1820s. They just always thought that. But also, Constantinople and Missouri were here, right there. If the Soviets get in here, that gives them access to the Mediterranean. And so, and by the way, oh, Turkey did have a, 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 const, or a constitutional republic. Homegrown de democracy. Yeah. Kind of going away now, but that's another story. But Britain was broke. Britain had no money at all. They're broke. They never really recovered from the war. You know, they lost many of their, they lost India at this time on the Indian won their independence because Britain was broke. They couldn't control or control those people anymore. So they asked the United States for aid. The U.S. had never done this in peacetime. The U.S. is demobilizing. The U.S. wants to pull back. A lot of people want to pull back. Uh, Republicans had just taken control of the House and the Senate for the first time since 1930, and they wanted to pull back. And so Truman was reluctant. But then the British said, well, you know who's really controlling these communist guerrillas? They're not guerrillas because of the nasty military dictatorship that's imprisoning people without trial and essentially uh, and torturing them. No, this is all part of whose grand design to take all of Europe. It's Stalin. 
Now, Truman wasn't sure, but figured Stalin was helping them. As it turned out, Stalin was actively discouraging them. Stalin did not want to offend the United States or Western Europe because Britain, Soviets were trying to rebuild. He might have down the road, but not here. So Truman went to Congress to ask for aid. But how is he going to convince people of the United States Congress to give money for Greece? They were pulling back to more isolationism. So what did he do? He scared them to death. He scared the conservative Republicans and Democrats in Congress that the Soviets, Stalin, is going to take over the world. And this is just step one. And for reasons I can't explain, I didn't capitalize all of them. All the other words are capitalized, but Will is not. I have no idea why, but I'm leaving it. This is all part of Stalin's grand plan, like he's toying with the Western allies, like a cat playing with their toy. Was this true? No. He thought Stalin might be trying to get Aries, but by no means did he have any proof of this. He exaggerated the Soviet threat to scare people to death. If we don't stop him in Greece, we'll be defending the shores of the United States tomorrow. What do you call it, though, if somebody exaggerates like that? That means he's going to be a thing. That's right. Well, he is demagoguing, which is playing on people's fears. He's also lying through his teeth, isn't he? If you say, I know something, I know Stalin is doing this, and you have no idea if he really is, you're lying. The Truman lied. Why? He thought, I have to do it. The only way to get weapons, because if not, this could lead to a problem down the road. And this is going to lead to the American policy of containment. George Keenan, a State Department official, wrote this anonymously called the Wrong Letter, where it laid out that we must stop the Soviets everywhere because they're bent on world domination. We must show the superiority of the Western way to this kind of regulated Keynesian capitalism. He actually said that in the Wrong Letter. He did not mean it to be military. But he sounded like military, and you notice it says contagion, like it's a disease that boards its way into your skull. So they're not just attacking in this valley. They're attacking in Asia. They're attacking in Europe. They're attacking in the Middle East. They're, saying they're going to take the brand new country of Iran. They used to be called Persia, now they're called Iran. They were going to go into Iraq and Syria to the Suez Canal, China, Manchuria, they're coming. And this will lead to the speech he gave would be called the Truman Doctrine. Now, a doctrine like the Monroe Doctrine, it doesn't mean it's actually like law, but it laid out American policy. The president has great authority over foreign policy. And this would be the basis of U.S. policy for over 70 years, meaning through today. For the United States has a duty to defend democracy. That was the reason I put that in quotes. Against tyranny from these communist states. So, in it, he laid out that communism is an ideological threat. It's something in your mind. So it's not like we're fighting these ethnic Germans or French or Japanese or whatever it might be. No, it's it's something in your mind. And indivisible, indivisible means what? It can't be what? Yeah, it can't be divided or spread apart. And that meant one communist the same as every other communist. They're all the same. They're indivisible. So one communist in Russia, the main communist in the Kremlin, a communist in Greece, or a communist in Wyoming are all the same. And what do they look like? How do you tell if someone's a communist? If it's something in your mind, how do you tell they're a communist? They act funny? So if you just do something different than other people, you're a commie? Why not? No one else wrote it. Red? Commie. You're not wearing red? That's what a commie would do to hide who they are. Yeah, this works. Red. 
and an Italian flag? Or is that Ireland? Where? Yeah, that's Italian. I couldn't see this. I couldn't see this red because he the Irish flag is almost the same, it just has orange. Tommy. Tommy. Blue, that's where the com that's how it works. I'm not, obviously, right? Because I'm pointing out the comments. <laughs> Next. Why is it such a threat then? Keenan called it the domino effect. You probably heard it as the domino theory. Does that make you know, sense? He called it the domino effect. If the struggle's everywhere, because if one country falls, they all fall. That meant really we're a bipolar world. It's us against them. And if a country falls to them, we lose. So the struggle has to be everywhere. You think, how can little Greece affect us? Well, Greece falls to the communists. They'll jump right to Italy, right? Then France, then Britain, and then who's next? Wyoming. Like a row of dominoes ending in Laramie. And we're all vulnerable. So we gotta stop them in Greece, or we gotta stop them in China, or we gotta stop them in Kenya. Gee, that's where we have kind of a socialist movement growing in there. Or we gotta stop them in Mexico or in Argentina. Point here. Is that, by the way, isn't the world so easy now? It's us against them. All the maps when I was a kid growing up, this is why this map, I wish they would have, this made in the 90s, they tried to go away from this. It was always red against blue. All the maps when I was a kid. Us, them, good guys, bad guys, free world, enslaved world, all that. Is the world that simple? Yes. No, it's not at all. The problems in Greece are not the same as the problems in Italy or France or Cheyenne. So with that, all roads lead to Wyoming. Don't forget, it's a rectangle for a reason. Lastly, everything is directed from the Kremlin. So the vision was, this one has like Stalin with dials, just dialing up revolution. What I, what I remember reading from someone in the 1950s, this idea was Stalin in his puffing his pipe, like walking by a map, saying, today we'll have revolution in Greece, tomorrow China, then we'll get to Canada. You know, something like that. Now, Stalin was an opportunist, but he certainly did not have that power. There would be no revolution in Greece if not for the fact that they had a really nasty military dictatorship. But we could avoid that. And this is total war thinking. Now we've gone to total war. And almost immediately, who can you trust? Even in your own country. Actually, that's a really good point. So everyone's going to start acting the same. Kind of goes against the whole idea of the United States, doesn't it? But look for somebody different. And so, last thing then, what did that mean? Will the U.S. defend democracy? This is actually going to be a real problem. We're going to send weapons to Turkey and Greece. Got it? Do we do another one? No thanks. Now I didn't tell you this, and I'll let it go. Okay. But it's supposed to be in pain. Oh, shoot. I forgot about that. I know you did. So you got to do it again at home in crayon. That's the punishment. Okay. I'll try. After I get home at 7 o'clock. <laughs> okay. We got it. All right. I'll grade it, but. You know what I'd like all of you to do? Have a good weekend. All of you. And I mean that sincerely. I'm and it's supposed to be, you know, it's kind of like, it's supposed to be like on a board. It's supposed to be like, it's like an old, they made it, they made it rustic with like little dark spots in it. Yeah. That was scary. <laughs> I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I didn't look at it. I don't know if it's a true color. So crazy. <laughs> Take out the little test. I hope everyone did well. I don't know, I was blocking you. I got a cast with you. It's very I'm listening to Vaughn. I'm listening to. I used to listen to that owl. Couple of the Vaughn owl. That's 30 years ago. <laughs> Take out uh, the test. How did we do on it? Did you grade it? Did you grade it? Yeah, I'm just correct though. Wait, who wrote on it? I wrote on it. Who wrote on it? How bad is it? I can't erase it though. I will, no, you did. You, it will come out of your paychecks for the rest of your life. Your paychecks are going to be gone issue. About. What should we have done? Well, if you get over sixty percent, you've done you've done fine. Okay, that works. If you got 